only 15 to 20% of the clothes we donate to charity get resold. The rest are shipped abroad, to countries that don't even necessarily want them, or they end up in landfill. I was pretty shocked to find that out, and that was just one of many eye-opening realisations in today's chat with my guests Gavin and Heather from Reaction. Welcome back, everyone. Just before we dive in today, I want to thank every single one of you that's listened, followed, and rated the show so far. I really do appreciate it, and the feedback I've had has been really, really warming. We're now entering that zone where most podcasts go to die, where they stop. Hosts get bored, they don't see the downloads that they want to see, and so they give up. Not so here. I've seen more than enough signs that this show is doing good things and we're here for the long haul. I don't like to obsess over streams and downloads and follower numbers. I like to look at qualitative data, the meaningful stuff, to see how this podcast is doing. So please do keep up the feedback, be it on the Spotify Q&A section or simply just by emailing me on cpi at soundquake.co.uk. And lastly, I just want to share some good positive news that you may have heard about a little while ago on this show uh, back in episode five with Laura Davis from The Kid Collective. The UK government has now scrapped the VAT tax on reusable sanitary wear such as period pants. A really, really big well done to Laura and everyone involved in that movement. That's a great step forward in encouraging people to consider using reusables by making them that bit more accessible and not taxing an outright necessity for half of the population. Now, on with the show. Gavin Fernie-Jones and Heather Davis set up Reaction, a collective network of outdoors enthusiasts, retailers, and those that love sustainability, to reshape how the outdoor clothes industry works. Now, I had no idea how many pieces of ski gear or climbing gear, for example, was ending up in landfill in other countries and causing further environmental damage in a country that's just been handed our burden. This is a great episode for those of us that want tangible and practical ways that we can make the world greener and create less waste. I, I founded Reaction with Heather. It's come out of several other projects, really. It started roughly five years ago with a repair day outside a ski shop that I own, or I used to own. We decided to do something positive a few years back on the very first Brexit day. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Time never actually uh, never came. <laughs> never never happened. It is it was a weekend resort in the ski resort. So firstly we live in a ski resort in the French wow. Alps. Love um, it. Which I haven't said of <laughs> which is pretty important to our story. Yeah. yeah. So yeah we live in a in a ski resort in the in the French Alps wow. and both been here I I've been here nearly eighteen years I think now and Me about there. fifteen years. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is home. For 10 of those years, I've owned a ski shop here. And yeah, as I said, that first Brexit day was coming along. There was not many people in resort because people believed flights were going to get grounded and stuff. So we thought we'd do something positive on that day. Uh, and we run this repair event outside the, the shop space. And a couple of weeks running up to that repair event, I started to ask my friends if they want to donate any secondhand clothing they've got that they don't use, any ski gear. And what we'll do is we'll we'll sell it all and then just use all the funds to plant as many trees as we possibly can. So it's, it's just something positive to do on a day. I mean, Brexit, obviously, for us was pretty impactful on our lives. It was a stressful period. We, we were pretty convinced we'd be able to stay here, but it, you know, it wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. So we just wanted to do something cool. Did that day and ended up doing a couple more that season in a couple of other places. And we actually raised 9,000 euros that we put towards tree planting. Wow. Just through through selling just, the, the repairs equipment? Wow. Yeah, just through selling repairs. And, and, and the, the repairs, when we ever do an event like this, the repairs are always for donations. Yeah, we used all of that to, to plant trees with an organization called Trees for the Future. They're an NGO that's a US NGO that works in Africa and they plant what they call forest gardens. So they... They go and work with a community for four years and they take like a monocrop piece of land and they plant a living hedge around the outside of it and really fast growing trees in year one and two. 
and that puts a lot of moisture and nutrients back into the soil. And then year three and four, they plant fruit and trees and vegetables, and they increase the yield, the food yield by about 400%. So it is a little bit about sequestering a bit of carbon, but it's more about a community, our community supporting another community, really, in the global south. And then off the back of that, we started a, a French sort of a, it's called an association, which is like a CIC in the UK. It's like a community-based not-for-profit. Mm. And that was called One Tree at a Time. That over a couple of years morphed into a community space here, which I've just come from just now, where we do, we have a big, big desk at the front of the, the community space and we do lots of workshops around repair, bike service. And today we've been converting sort of secondhand ski pants that are not really great for resale. We've been converting them into sleeping bags for people who are living on the streets in Leon. So we've been doing that this morning. Wow. So we basically, accept loads of secondhand gear and we keep it in use in our community. It's, it's this really sort of creative space. Like we focus on uh, using the local skills and local creativity. We've got a few employees and one of the biggest revenues we've had there is actually patching over the logos on, on donated uniforms. Okay. So we get a lot of uniforms donated to us, like ski gear mm. from ski instructors. And we actually patch over the logos and then resell them. Now this this stuff normally would just go to landfill. Well, so. yeah. yeah, so that that's the logos of the of the ski companies, like the chalet companies, the transfer companies, the ski ski schools and resorts. So mm. they quite often have really nice branded kit, like you know North Face, Patagonia, you yeah. name it. They'll use it for a season, and then it'll be discarded right. because maybe they change their colorway, or maybe they. They want to update their kits and whatever. So, but there's still loads of life left in these products. Yeah. So, what the One Tree team do, they do these amazing patches and make sure that they're more or less waterproof and everything. And then that jacket can be resold as a jacket to some, you know, a holiday maker or somebody who lives in the area. I think an interesting little thing to note on on that is that our community space we, we reuse about ninety percent of the stuff that comes through the door. So. That might be like resold. It might be turned into something else. We might strip the zips out of it and use it for a different repair. We might use the physical fabrics for some patching. And the industry standard, like in a secondhand store, is about 15 to 25% of the stuff donated is actually reused and resold in store. Wow. What happens with the rest? Uh, so the rest is shipped, exported abroad. So if you, if you drop a bag off at your local charity store, literally 15 to 25% that is usable. The rest is shipped and exported. Most of it, at the minute, it ends up in Ghana, where they receive 15 million garments a week, secondhand garments, and uh, well over 50% of those are completely unusable. Really? There is a trade in secondhand items, but the problem is that a lot of the stuff that they're receiving is either damaged or stained or, or culturally inappropriate, like a ski jacket going to Ghana <laughs> yeah. is no use whatsoever. And so what ends up happening is these things form massive clothes mountains and as that decomposes obviously that releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere it also pollutes waterways the polluted waterways promotes disease it, you know it blocks blocks water courses and so on so it's really like we're just exporting our problem elsewhere really yeah one of the figures is that 1.4 billion the equivalent of 1.4 billion t-shirts actually leaves the uk each year as secondhand exported products and I can believe it, that we do get an insane amount of donations. and Just from the UK? That's just the UK, I mean, when you yeah. consider the size of the population, that's incredible. That's, that's wild. A lot of that as well will come directly from the brands. So brands have around about 30% of the products they ever make are never sold. Hang on. <laughs> so, the, you know, this, that amazes me because these are, that, that's, you know, directly coming from the source of normally a business set up to make profit from what they sell. How how are they letting that slide? You know, thirty percent of what they make just you know, even for their own interests, some that blows my mind. It's better to overstock. Like if you overstock, you don't sell out. It's actually better because the the cost you're paying per garment is so small. Mm. Like they they actually lose money if they sell out. Yeah, the the cost is built into the products that we buy. Right. So the t shirt that you actually buy for thirty quid or whatever, yeah, that thirty percent waste is built into that cost i see yeah they're not daft are they <laughs> they don't give money away <laughs> no okay that yeah that makes sense that i did i've never heard of that before and that is 
that's quite alarming. I've not heard about this, so you know, I am a a muggle. You're going to have to kind of walk me through this. So, how did you become aware of this? Like, what you know, what would the indicator to you that there was just tons and tons of waste? You know, was, was you in Garnered or is it through the skiing? Like, how did you kind of how did this get onto your radar? I just kept going from that original fix it day and seeing so much waste. Like my mates coming to me and giving us five pairs of ski pants to sell and they've got two at home still. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there's something in this as well. Like when, when you take a bag of clothing to a charity store, you're essentially unburdening, your, unburdening yourself of that impact. You're, you're giving it to that charity store and going, right, I've done the right mm. thing. Like I've given all this stuff to charity. The right thing's going to happen with it. It isn't, and if you're on the opposite side of that that thing, so when someone donates it to me, I take on all your burdens. Like I have to decide whether we're going to try and repair it. I have to decide whether I'm going to put it in a clothing bin and that it might get exported thousands of kilometers to another part of the globe that doesn't want it. And then what I'll actually do is make sure that a lot of it goes direct to landfill because I don't want it to be involved in that process. So if someone gives us some stuff like Heather said that is stained, that is damaged, the last thing I want it to do is to travel thousands of kilometers to a country that doesn't want that stuff. Mm. So it's a really, it's hard working on that side of things. It's, it's quite, it's quite a tricky thing to do because you get to see this. Yeah. And I guess we, we have like clothing bins at our tips here, like they call it out of the Shetri, like a clothing bin It's a closed sealed bin that you can't see into. You know, you just drop that thing in there, that bag, and just go, right, my job is mm. done. And there's no connection to what really happens to that stuff afterwards. There's no understanding. There's no, like, information to tell you what's yeah. happening to it. It's a very closed system. I'm just kind of sort of scratching my head a bit there. I, I would have been, well, would have been absolutely am one of those people that when I, I think I'm quite good and I keep my clothes for a long time, probably past when they're, you know, looking their best. And then when I do decide, okay, that's, you know, time for them to go, I will take them to the charity shop. And I was fully under the impression that that was a great way, you know, for them to find a new home, to get used. I assumed I'd, you know, give them a bag of stuff and it would all be out on the rack, you know, to be resold within that week. Now, I guess part of me thought maybe it's that is a bit too good to, re- to be true. When I walked back into the same charity shop, I didn't see much of my stuff about. <laughs> so are you... You know, is that just the the way that industry works? Like, not much of it gets, you know, th- that desirable goal doesn't really materialize. I mean, I think if, you, if you've worn that garment to oblivion, which is what you should be doing, like, well done for doing that, it's obviously going to be a very hard thing to, to reuse. Mm. In our space, we will try and reuse the, the parts of the fabric that we can. So we'll use them for patching. We'll use the bits and pieces and, yeah, we will repair stuff and, We'll get it used, but I guess there's always going to be an element of waste. I think the real problem with this is that stuff does get shipped great distances in big sealed bales. So bales of clothing wrapped in plastic that people in Ghana purchase unopened, but they have no idea what's in there. So they're paying money for this stuff. Yeah. It's a gamble for mm. them, isn't it? So yeah, like that's kind of like, it sounds strange. That's why I try and make some of the, make sure some of the really worst like quality stuff does end up in local landfill. Wow. Like that shocks a lot of people that that's what I'm doing. But the opposite of that is to send it great kilometers yeah. to somewhere that just, you know, we can't deal with that waste here. We don't have a sit. We don't have a system for that. We don't have fabric to fabric recycling. What people can do though is find a local organization like One Tree at a Time. And they do exist in more places than you might imagine. There are groups like in community centers springing up. There are, there are people, seamstresses and seamstresses that actually will take a waste fabric and then turn it into something like repurpose it into something else. So a really good example of that is there's perhaps not fabrics, but dirt bags, for example, they take old climbing rope and they turn that into new products that useful products that people can use. Then little recreations, Kirsty, she takes waste from festival sites and that's normally like banners or perhaps tent fabric things like that and then turns that into new new products the problem is that with the fast fast fashion industry and these micro seasons that the shops have always pushing you know new products or this it's, it's this color it's this style it's this and that people are constantly changing their wardrobes and because it's so cheap to do so as well 
The trouble with all that stuff is that the quality is so poor that it doesn't have a resale value in the UK. Right. So, okay. So, in that, with that in mind, what do you think is you know you, you're you kind of you've got your solution for a, an element of the problem, but kind of bigger picture, what do you think needs to be changing? Like, is it you know we talk about circular economy and everything getting used and and essentially eliminating. Uh, uh, you know in an ideal scenario all waste but maybe that's too ideal but what's kind of the the bigger picture i think we need to go back to a buy once buy well kind of culture you know where we actually where the the quality of the items is prioritized you buy once you know think back to kind of pre-war pre first and second world war you would you would have like one or two suits or a one perhaps a winter overcoat and you would you would spend as much money as you could to buy the best thing that you could afford, and then you would maintain it. You would you know you would have it repaired. You would have it tailored to fit you. You would replace buttons. You would all that kind of stuff. I think we need to go back to that sort of culture. And then the other thing that we need to support that is actually to help people understand or learn, relearn how to repair, or to have repair services on the high street in, or in places that people can access in, in, in people's communities. I think if you, if you think of like a vintage shop, like if you pop in a vintage shop, the secondhand products in there are good. They're, they're really long lasting and they were just made better in the seventies and eighties. Oh really? <laughs> Things were made to last. <laughs> and they were just more, more quite like more durable and they're still around the stuff that we're getting delivered now. There's no chance it's going to be usable and it's not usable in this current state. It's such poor quality and it, this is because it's crazy things like on some of this stuff, like the thread count in the cotton, say they were making it before with six pieces of thread. They might, to save save money, just do it for free because they're doing it on such like vast volumes that will make quite a big difference. Mm. So like the actual quality of the fabrics and the materials and the cottons and stuff have just been yeah. been slashed and th- that means they're not they're not durable. And and again, got a bit of an obsession with stuff getting lighter, especially in sports. Running, for example, where he- Adidas have just created a shoe that's a one new shoe, like one marathon and you're done. Like, is that the design? Is that the selling point? Yeah, single use shoe. <laughs> wow. But apparently it'll help you run faster. So you know well, it has. Someone's got the marathon record wearing yeah. it. <laughs> wow. That that just strikes me as a bit of a you know, that's a bit of a blunder. They know they I mean they, you know, they've made terrible efforts to do it, but they know that it's important to people you know they they tried the recycled plastic bottle thing didn't they i mean they they made a bit of a pig's ear of it but they know that the, the market is demanding more and more of those sort of responsible choices they're going to worm their way around it but that is a real bad kind of look isn't it <laughs> to, to to make mm-hmm. a one new shoe that's quite incredible do you think there's something in just you know inherently a bit flawed with the idea of fashion it's like being fashionable designed for a season for you know for something that's just for the summer yeah and and that particular summer it won't be cool next year i think there's just something inherently wrong with that and we need to drop the kind of seasonality of clothes yeah there needs to be more there needs to be more functionality over over fashion i think but it's very easy for us to sit here and say mm. that you know like yeah there, there are ways that there's definitely ways that you can use creativity in terms that it doesn't have to be for fashion mm. It could be for, you know, visible, visible repairing has become quite a big trend. And that's quite exciting because you can basically make a one-off, you can make a a one-off item simply by adding a design or doing a visible repair that, you know, someone, even if they had the same original base jacket, it wouldn't look the same. Is, th- is, there, so, is there a material element to all this? Okay, so this T-shirt I'm wearing now, which if, for those at home not watching, you might see it, it's just a plain T-shirt. So I got this from Rapa Nui, who I'm kind of hoping you've heard mm. of. Is that a good yep. way to go? Just buying from, from you know, brands that, you know, work with this from the ground, they use recycled materials. I think they have a scheme we can send it back and they'll they'll kind of reuse it again. Is that something we can, you know, kind of take as that's a good option like you know buy from more responsible brands yeah and i think that they're one of the most responsible because they've actually built a circular model of reusing you know you can send your tea back to them and they will make another tea out of it and for certain garments like t-shirts underwear and stuff like we're, we're going to use them at a fast rate mm. and yeah we're going to we're going to need to use them still like 
and it's things like ski jackets and stuff like they're made of plastic for the outdoors. You could, they're going to be here in, although Hevis says they're going to start biodegrading down in Ghana, they're still going to be in that pile two in 200 years time. So this is stuff that isn't designed to degrade. It's designed to be used in the outdoors and last long lasting. I would say if you think as well about other garments like jeans, again, you can make a much more durable jean due, due to the type of fabric and materials you're using. You can, you can make something that lasts a lot longer. A lot of the jeans now contain a hell of a lot of elastic in them. Mm-hmm. So they're more fitted, they're more elasticated. They might, yeah. So it, it, they, they can definitely be big gains made in what we use in the materials and then build quality. Like it has to, has to start there. And then we've got to spend a lot of effort educating people just about the impact of this stuff that they own. Like, you know, I, I've been on a journey on that time and I've, I've learned lots of different things and I've really started to learn about the impact of my clothing and I've associated that with climate change. Now, when I'm in that, that shop and someone comes in, there's there's quite a few people that wouldn't understand that a polyester garment is, is oil, is plastic. They, you know, it's called polyester, it's called nylon and you go, oh, it's plastic and then they don't necessarily make that association. Mm. So there's obviously a huge, huge piece about education and providing services like repair and reuse and, and rental, which is what we're kind of focused on. Yeah, let's 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 go there. <laughs> let's talk about you know what what you're doing now with Reaction. I'm I'm keen to hear you know all, all about that, what that's set up to to do, and and yeah, your current kind of work and efforts with that at the moment. The story continued right from one tree. So one tree at a time is completely self-funded by the waste in our community so we've got employees with not have any funding it's it's working and i was speaking on a podcast with a lady called Catherine weep and called the circular economy podcast we'd, we'd finished and she started just chatting to me about scale and could we scale that impact and my first responses to that were kind of a bit cold because i i don't believe well firstly i don't, I don't want to open five six seven eight nine one tree at a time community spaces because I don't like there's so much time and effort invested in each one of those I don't really want that to become my thing to be honest mm. and I want bigger Im- want to have bigger impact than that and so she started talking about this idea of scaling out of creating a, a network and that's where me and Heather just started talking from there just started discussing possibilities we both read a couple of books mm. did you read Less Is More I don't know mm-hmm. maybe yeah read Less Is More by Jason Hickel which is all around degrowth and then a book by John Alexander called Citizens, which has probably been the biggest influence on this on this project. Yeah, so reactions basically, rather than Gav said, opening lots of different community spaces and so on, it was basically to take the principles of one tree at a time and actually say, look, we we found loads of things that work really well here. We think that they could work in your community too, but we're not going to impose them on you. We want to sort of educate you about them and for you to pick and choose the things that you think will work. And we want to be able to support you because we want to continue learning as well. And so the ideas in the way that One Tree runs, we thought could apply to more than just the outdoor winter sports industry here. It could apply to surfing communities, sailing communities, climbing, anything really. And so... We just we we just started talking to what well, Gav Gav did uh, the majority of the legwork of just putting out there what we were doing and saying is anyone else interested in this? Is anyone else doing this? And applying the kind of principle of citizens, which is the idea of working out what it is that you care about and what you want to do. Then you go out there and find other people who think the same way as you, and then together you go you go forth and you and you realize your vision so so yeah that's what we did and now we're up to about 36 organizations who we work with and we basically just share ideas and support each other ask each other questions learn from each other we get together sometimes in different spaces and yeah we're just trying to propel the circular economy basically in in the area of kind of outdoor sports mainly and in that we've got organizations that do repair that do repurposing materials into new products we've got rental businesses we've got peer-to-peer lending and swapping services 
can be yeah. used, so second-hand. Yeah, second-hand, so yeah, a bit like one tree at a time where they're taking products and either repairing them and reselling them or patching them and reselling them. And we've also got an organization that's sort of trying to pioneer a few different solutions. Do you want to talk about Michael, what he's doing? Yeah, so I'd say, I guess another sector that we're kind of involved in is redistribution, and that's getting these products into into the hands of people who could could use them. And so Michael runs an organization called Pre-Love Sports. He's a force of energy, never stops, <laughs> should stop a bit. Well, and he collects actually one of the hardest bits of waste to deal with, and that's that sports clothing, like running gear, cycling gear. That's that's definitely a lot harder to deal with than a ski jacket. Mm. And then he redistributes that, or he redistributes. So the ways he redistributes that is some of it is resold. So it goes onto a site and he resells it. And the money from that runs, it's a CIC, keeps the CIC ticking over. Some of it recently he's partnered with a boxing gym in Manchester for children that are underprivileged. Um, they box uh, in their uniforms, in the school uniforms normally, like turn up and the, they box. The, the service is run by the local fire brigade, which has been really important because uh, when the fire brigade attend fires now, they get less hassle from the local community because they've been integrated into it more. He also does stuff like he has just been giving loads of kit to Kirsty that I haven't mentioned earlier, who runs Little Wee Creations, and she's been making into some new stuff, which is, I've just caught a glimpse of today. I won't spoil their announcement. It's soon to be launched. It looks looks really good, so that's coming soon. And we've been working on a a, a project with him around rebranding that equipment. So a lot of that t-shirts that donated might be finisher jerseys from a race you often get a a race jersey when you finished a race which i would first encourage race providers to stop doing (laughs) firstly but there's a lot of that stuff already out there if you think like you know like when you've done a marathon there's always going to be excess anyway so they're not going to have the right amount of right size of the jerseys for everyone they're probably going to order again 20 to 30 percent extra just to make sure they can people can have the right Mm. size so a lot of this stuff is never worn and it gets given to him and he actually patches over the logos. By covering up the logo or the date or whatever it might be where with the Reaction logo or the Pre-Love Sports logo, he can then resell them. I love that. You know, I, and, you know I'd love to see. I'd love to see something a bit more a bit more brutal, like leave the logo where it is, but a big red X over it. Someone can still see yeah. who's guilty, <laughs> yeah. right? Who's trying to say, and then your logo underneath it. Say, so this is where it is now. <laughs> we're, we're actually taking that one, well, Michael and myself have been working, taking it one step further. And Michael's been doing lots of testing on different fabrics to add logos. And what we've put together is a proposal now for charities where they, instead of ordering up T-shirts and getting new T-shirts for each event, they can get their, 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 their athletes, the people that are running for them, that are raising their sponsorship to actually send us a t-shirt they already own and we'll print the charity logo onto it uh, and return it to them. So that's a good to get idea. The process. And maybe like, you know, maybe over time these t-shirts could end up with all the different marathon, you know, maybe we could add the, the, the title of the marathon in the year onto each t-shirt and you might end up with like a t-shirt that you've done 10 marathons in. And that's great. That kind of history of the event. I like that a lot. So that's something we're trying. And so this is the things we try to put in action, action but it's really cool because we do it, we do it like as a collective. Mm. So like introducing these things is really quick and fast because there's lots of us chipping in and helping out. And we've got lots of experience now of working with different fabrics and different, yeah, different yeah. materials. And it, that, yeah, we're kind of able to get these things to market in a sense really yeah, fast. The power of your, you know, the, the community and the tribe and, and actually sharing your expertise across industry, that, that is powerful, isn't it? It's definitely more, like you say, more impactful than you just setting up the, the, you know, the same kind of thing and replicating it, but bringing people in and yeah, bringing their expertise in their particular niche and sport. I think that's a, that's a great idea. I think with, you know, the underlying problem here with all this stuff is consumerism, right? big big problem and it's now thursday the 23rd of november for for anyone <clears throat> listening to this not when it goes out tomorrow is a big day friday the 24th otherwise known as to many black friday now my guess is you guys will not be partaking in that because you have something else <laughs> that you do on black friday so tell me all about that So, yeah, I think it's fair to say that we're very anti-Black Friday and everything that it represents in terms of not only overconsumption, 
But also, it's all about big business. It's not about community. It's not about supporting small businesses. The only benefit is in the pockets of the the shareholders of these big businesses. Meanwhile, the planet and people in small communities and small business lose out. And what's actually happening on that day is that people have this rush of dopamine as they anticipate the purchase that they're going to make. And it's, and it's this kind of addictive nature of, of shopping and anticipating these purchases and everything that, that Black Friday represents and, and contributes to that, that we're against. And so we came up with an alternative campaign, which is called Citizen Friday. And there's three elements to Citizen Friday. It's about share repair and get out in the fresh air. And the reason for that is that there's enough clothing on the planet to clothe the next six or seven generations of people. Wow. wow. Why, why are we making new stuff? Why can't we use circular models and share what we've got? And by sharing, that could be that could that could involve rental. So you have you know one product and lots of lots of different people use it at different times. It could be peer-to-peer resale sharing things that way. It could be sharing more than just products as well. What about sharing time? What about sharing your expertise, your knowledge, volunteering, things like that? So this whole thing about sharing and actually embracing that community that you're in and being part of that community. The next thing is about repair. So that's about not letting our clothing, our products go to waste before they're at the end of their useful life. And when we talk about repair, we also talk about repurposing. So that deals with that end of life piece as well. So that's all about learning to repair yourself, finding somebody in your community who could repair, you know, actually connecting the dots, you know. And then the last one is all about getting out in the fresh air. As I said, shopping online gives you this rush of dopamine with the anticipation of a purchase. But actually, if you just go outside you get dopamine, but you also get serotonin. You also get oxytocin. And these are those really feel-good hormones that are combined with dopamine, just make you feel great. You also get vitamin D. Just the act of being out in a forested area can be so beneficial for your mental well-being as well. And we called it Citizen Friday because the opposite of a consumer and this is according to John Alexander, who wrote the book Citizens. The opposite of, con- of a consumer isn't a non-consumer. It's actually a citizen. And a citizen is somebody who exercises their agency and who can kind of think outside of the constraints of what we're being told. So he talks about three stories over, over time. The first one being the subject story where kings and queens ruled the land and the subjects just followed their orders. And that was how you, you, you did well, how you, how you were a good citizen. And then after the Second World War came the, the, the consumer story, which was all about, it's all right, the, the government, yeah, we're the government, we've got things in hand. All you need to do is support the economy by buying things. And he argues that we're, we're passing into a third phase now, which is the, or the third story, which is the citizen story which is a story that actually existed pre the subject story where people used to work in communities for the betterment of their community. And so that's what we want people to embrace. We want people to sort of disengage with that consumer story and engage with what it means to be a citizen and someone who is part of nature, not adjacent to nature and so on and so forth. So. The only thing I would sort of add on that is um, I feel quite strongly that the consumer story is collapsing. So if you think of certain things that might be happening, like in the UK, school roof problems and stuff like that, like it is, is the, the economy is still growing, but is it actually improving the lives of citizens, of, of people? But through the consumer story, we're allowed to introduce things like pensions and healthcare and free schooling and stuff like that. So it definitely happened, but I don't, I don't think that system now is, is feeding into that. It's definitely, we definitely entered a time where there's a huge, huge, huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, so something is going to come out of that. Something is going to emerge. And John Alexander 
talks about lots of examples and he's, he's been out here and spoken before with us guys and like got to spend quite a lot of time with him actually learning about all the different examples that happen in, across the globe. And there is a lot of examples of the citizen story emerging. I think the ultimate extension of the citizen story is more participatory governance and citizens assemblies and they're starting to emerge. We've had a, a couple of those in France now and yeah, different, different countries around the world are, are looking into that. So yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can actually see this occurring in real time. It's been really, really cool with this campaign. Is it's, it's probably of the time, I think, but it's really caught the imagination. We've, well, Heather's done an amazing job at making it, <laughs> as she just explained it, really understandable. Yeah. <laughs> really simple for people to get their heads around. But also, I think it's very much of the time, this campaign. And 100%. Really yeah. attention. And, I, and I know there's been a pushback against Black Friday for a few years, but it does suddenly feel like... Well, we, yeah, so. absolutely. I think people are just a bit sick of it now. It just feels, it's just, oh, again, uh, I think we're starting to see through the, is it actually even a good deal? Probably not. It's also Black Friday for a week and then it gets extended for another week and then the cyber. And I think, yeah, everyone's starting to, to, to see through it a bit and it's lost its whatever magic it did have, which is evident in America, I think, when you see their Black Fridays. But that's that's something I'm interested in, this, the, the, the global kind of you know element to it and that is this sort of more symptomatic of rich western cultures and, and i'll give an example of a place i went to where i i just noticed the stark difference in kind of consumerism okay i spent a little bit of time not long in in norway and immediately just noticed there weren't massive billboards and brands and advertising, at least everywhere. Like everyone kind of had nice stuff. And it's the first place I went where I saw Teslas everywhere. Everyone had a Tesla. I thought, well, that's new. So there was, yeah, there was money and wealth and people well off. But you looked around and you could feel how clean the air was. And there just wasn't brand. Just I it just sent it to me, it just it just felt like there was lacking consumerism. So I'm interested, you said, you know, you've, you've seen sort of these citizen stories crop up around the world what you know some examples and stories you might have of that in france it's it's not the the, the advertising and the level of advertising we see is greatly reduced we especially live in an area where it's further reduced to be honest but we're not too far from a city called grenoble and i think it was about 2014 the the mayor the council there decided to ban all street advertising so in most cities and towns and that, the the advertising boards are owned by the by the council, like the boards and, and the and the spaces on the buses, you know, the advertising spaces on the buses, for example, are owned by the council to make revenue yeah. off it. And they, they decided to ban it, ban it and said it wasn't for the better of society. So we do live in a space, like some of the stuff we talk about, I sometimes let me and Heather probably live in a place that's a little bit more privileged or a little bit easier to put some of these things in into mm. action. Like I don't have a TV and I live in the outdoors most of the time. So I don't see this, this stuff. So we understand that that is, is definitely a bit of an advantage. And another thing that we kind of have here is our, our work is very seasonal. So I might work really intensely for six months and then I might have a lot of downtime for the other six months. And that does give me more opportunity to become a citizen. It gives me that opportunity to invest my spare time into my community and my friends and relationships and stuff. So. In some ways, I understand like why this story isn't isn't taking hold in other places because people are time stretched maybe or and financially stretched, mm. and they're facing what John Alexander says is up to ten thousand adverts a day. What? Yeah, I mean that's that's regarding like if you walk past the fridge and you see all the different Coca Cola, like all the different drinks and stuff in there. But that is still there, you know. That's still the consumer story speaking speaking to you. I have to say, like. Back in the UK recently, I stopped to fill up with petrol and I couldn't believe it. Honestly, there was six adverts in front of me on the petrol pump. Most of them were for like vapes, high energy drinks, like rest of the stuff. And then I walked across the forecourt and then the bollards outside the shop, they had like these sleeves over and each one of them had an advert on. And then you've got all the newspapers and everything outside and all that stuff. And then you walk past like rows of chocolate. A lot of these things as well are like massively low benefit. To the economy all right they might grow the economy and the fact that we're buying more stuff but they're generally bad for our health it's costing country money in terms of healthcare and so well, on. That, yeah but there is just what gav was saying about having the time to exercise your kind of agency as a citizen we've got 
obviously we've got an article coming out tomorrow to coincide with Black Friday that talks about all the different elements of the Citizen Friday campaign. And we've actually linked it in with the idea at the end of continuing the campaign, the Citizen Friday campaign, Mm. and perhaps linking it in with the idea of a four-day week. Because there's just been the most incredible trial of of the four-day week, and it's been a huge success for businesses as well as for the people involved. And 92% of those businesses are going to continue with the four-day week, having trialed it, because they found that their team are more productive even over four days than they were over five days they've also found that it's better for recruitment you know people want to work for companies that do a four-day week and it saved them loads of uh, money and absenteeism and things like that so uh, the people reported that it was much better for their for their well-being for their mental health but also they used their day in a re- their extra day in a really meaningful way they used it to volunteer or they used it to connect with people and families and, and do the things that perhaps they wouldn't normally have the time to do. So we're actually looking to continue the campaign beyond Black Friday and actually m- embed the idea of Citizen Friday into maybe work cultures, but definitely kind of bring it into the consciousness of people in general. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know on that is the trial was, it was 180, 100 format. So do 100% of the pay, 80% of the time and 100% of the work. So yeah. like the workers are still getting the same pay. They're expected to do the same amount of work and actually they actually did more. <laughs> like Heather said, it was more productive. But it's really important because I, I, another thing like we live in a part of the world where people still shut for lunchtime. Business shut for lunch here. Like, yeah, two hours. For two hours for lunch, even the bakery a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hang on, I thought that was, that was a big thing lunch. in France. You weren't allowed to close all of the bakeries at the same time. That to stagger their closing time. Yeah. So there was always <laughs> one open, unless you're the only one in town. Yeah, there'll be one open. Uh, and then su- Sunday still is a, yeah, it's a day, day for us. us. Yeah, like, I, I think that makes total sense. And I'm, I guess I'm quite lucky. You know, I, I work for myself, so I, I make time in my calendar for these sort of things. You know, I, I volunteer and... Yeah, not necessarily a, a Friday, but I make time in my, my calendar to do that because I can. And a lot of people, you know, doing the nine to fives, they, they can't do that. You know, Monday to Friday, nine to five, you've got no chance to to give back. You just you're, you're constantly kind of, you know, on that on that rat race, aren't you? And like you say, like growing the economy for, for the sake of growing the economy. Like there's so many things wrong with that, isn't there? You know, even these advertising companies, when they spend money on creating ads, well, that contributes to GDP. They've spent money there. People go and buy the thing they're selling. That contributes GDP. It makes them unhealthier. They need healthcare. That contributes to GDP. GDP skyrocketing. Well, that's great. Except, no, it isn't. <laughs> There's so many things wrong with it, and it's it was a it, you know I think it's quite a, a flawed design from from the outset, as admitted by the the chap that invented it, whose name I do forget. I think it was a Polish guy who came up with GDP during the war. If that if I'm prepared to be correct on that, my memory's not great. But anyway, that's that. I digress. That's me uh, whinging about GDP. The last couple of things I'd like to do, kind of give you the chance to, to use your imagination and paint me a picture of a world where we've got a hold of this, you know, like where the circular economy is in f- full motion, literally, I suppose. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have excess waste. Clothes aren't for just fashion. They're for purpose and that purpose comes around every year. What does that world look like? Like, you know, what benefits can we see there? I mean, it's a lot more localized. And I, the, the, the the parts of the circular economy that we really like to focus on, and I generally think have the biggest impact, is making sure circularity is localized. So you can do all those bits, like the repair, the reuse, the sharing skills, the sharing of the products. You can do all of those bits before you get to the the recycling to turn before you get to turn it into another product and that's that's what we really kind of need to focus on we've got within our collective we've got a, a lady called rebecca who runs an organization called utilifolk and what she does is she works with a local charity store and she takes garments from the local charity store and reworks them into new garments so they might get pieced together and the stuff that she's making is very not just localized geographically but localized in its fashion and style like it's her it's, it's her vision and I kind of see a vision where that expands, where, you know, you might 
go to Sheffield, for example, and there might be a particular fashion that's taken on ho- taken hold there, and it's a fashion that's made from the secondhand garments that are readily available there, and the people that are working in that space. And you might go to Leeds, for example, and it's it's slightly mm. different. And I think that's that's important because I think people will ultimately still always want a, a, a fashion to be involved in this some way, and I think you can introduce that through through that model, and you can you know some of the stuff these people are making, like Beck at Utilifec, is just incredible and it, it's beautiful stuff and it's got even more story to it you want to wear it you want to wear it for longer you want to celebrate it you want to look after it because you know someone's put more time and effort back into that so i think that would be a part of it have your your vision yeah i think for me it would be the element of community that would be brought back in you know we're in a loneliness epidemic despite the fact that we're in some ways more connected to each other than ever. You know, we don't have that face-to-face contact or those micro-conversations that we would have had when we went from shop to shop to buy, you know, our butter from the dairy and our bread from the bakery and our veg from the from the greengrocers mm-hmm. and so on. And so I feel like we're missing out on a lot of contact. And I think by by bringing that sort of those local services back almost re upskilling and reskilling people on a community level and the interaction that can then happen and the 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 skill sharing and 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 then more learning and everything it, it's sort of it's like a a virtuous cycle then that and everyone's sort of pulled upwards rather than this race to the bottom that we're seeing with kind of Black Friday and things like that. And the other thing for me is that we we learn to do things again with our hands, mm-hmm. practical things, that, and we feel good about that. When I mend an item of my clothing, I feel <laughs> like I genuinely feel really yeah. chuffed. And and I love it, and I'm like, wow, look what I did! You know, it's, it's such a good point. I, I think uh, on that, on that really quickly, I think there must be there's something in the education system that's changed there because my my mum and dad, great with their hands, can repair stuff, can fix clothes, can do electrics and a bit of mechanic, you know, that kind of thing, basic level, but can do it. And I also was like, how do you know how to do this? Like, this isn't your your job. I was like, well, we got taught it at school. We done textiles. We done woodwork. We done. I was like. Well, we don't do any of that. <laughs> that was when I was at school. Now, I dare say, I don't know, probably even less so. It's probably now just computer programming. I don't know what the syllabus is. But yeah, doing things with your hands is, feels like that's long gone, doesn't it? Which is a real shame. I think there's another big important point to what I said there about community. Yeah. Because we've got to provide these solutions within geographical communities, something that is accessible to people. But we've talked, I've talked about this a bit recently, but like a lot of the sustainability solutions at the minute that are out there are not necessarily affordable. Mm. Like yeah. I can afford an electric car or maybe can't even charge it at the minute. Organic food, for example, is expensive and, and things like that. And actually we need to create solutions that affect people's day-to-day lives, are ones that they can engage with, can save, you know, you save money when you repair something, you save money when you keep it in use, you know, when you wear it, every time you wear it again, like you're saving yourself effectively money. And so we do need these kind of solutions that impact people within a community. Because if we don't build these, the counter argument will always be that doing the sustainable action or making the green choice is going to hurt your wallet. It's going to make your life more expensive. It's going to it's going to be difficult to put into action. So the counter argument is always going to be we can't do this. It's it's too expensive. So I, I think that this is a very key element of this conversation. It's kind of this sort of action, this sort of work that we're doing helps swell that middle middle ground it gives people a, a route to getting involved a foot in the door like it gives you an actionable and a solution that you can you can do it's not something that you're just thinking oh, i'm just going to rely on the government to bring some legislation in. yeah that in itself is also really important because the government are going to have to bring in legislation around this stuff so we're going to have to swell the middle ground for people to be accepting of that legislation yeah, yeah. like we don't get the majority on board saying yep yeah, I'm all right with this legislation that's invariably going to impinge my life in some way then that we've got big problems. So I think it's a big part of all that. Yeah, the the community aspect definitely is a big one, isn't it? Like, I think we've really lost something in this, you know, this race to efficiency. Like you say, you know, like, yes, it is more efficient for me to go to one shop and buy all my groceries and my clothes and everything I need for my kitchen all in one massive supermarket. It's massively efficient, but you do lose, you know, a bit of magic and connection with that. And I... I do see 
a little bit of a reversal in that. Maybe it's just in me and the people I know, but yeah, I've definitely noticed some some small changes there. And and again, you know, like you know, like you say the, the the cost thing. That's super interesting because I think so many people the way we think about money and savings, it's very hard to monitor what you don't spend, but it's very very easier to buy something half price and think you've saved 50%, right? Like you've got that back. So, you know, I was going to go buy this new coat. It's £100. I got £50. I've saved £50. Like you could have saved £100 if you just used the one you already had that there's nothing wrong with. <laughs> but it's not as yeah. fun, is it? That's the problem. There's a mindset issue there. It's not necessarily, and I wouldn't blame anyone, it's not a mindset issue essentially necessarily. If you're getting advertised to and being told that the consumer story is your role, then that, you accept that that's your role and... It is hard to break out of that, especially if you're seeing it on, we're conditioned to see the stuff on TV, even in school, in, in the school system. I come in when I went to school, you could buy a can of Coke <laughs> out of the vending machine from age 10. Mm. So yeah, like we're kind of, this stuff has been into our lives. And actually now, like almost even worse than that is that the younger generation have, well, we all have this on our phones. We have this on us all, this advertising on us at all times. I think it's, very bad that we allow this to happen to young people, certainly, like for them to see, see these advertisements. I was on a call yesterday and uh, the girl that was on the call was saying, like, if I look at something on Google, like, I will get that thing advertised me to me a hundred times on Instagram and TikTok until I buy it. You know, like, I've looked at it. The rest of the web knows I've looked at it. So I'm just going to keep getting served it. And, and we've created that system as well. And so I, I don't blame people for making these decisions. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I, I'm definitely a big fan of personal responsibility and agency, but that is absolutely being chipped away at by, you know, by the system. You can only be a product of that to, to a certain extent, can't you? It's very hard to, um, to live outside that if that's what we've created. Yeah, it, it is kind of frightening, the advertising space, you know, certainly when it's so good and effective in the sense that you, you, you know, you're pretty sure your phone's listening to you, right? When you've, you know, you mention something to someone and you think, well, and an ad pops up and it's worse than that. It's way worse than that. They know you so well, they don't need to listen to yeah. you. They don't need to listen to your conversations because they know what you're likely to be talking about in a given day, week, hour, the person you're with, like, it's that smart. That's way scarier than being listened to. I think you, you're having your mind read at that point, and it's it's yeah. very frightening. Let's wrap this up. I'm I'm really really keen to know from you guys. You're doing great work, and I always like to know from people such as yourself who you think is doing great work. So what I would like to do is just give you an opportunity to give a shout out to someone that you think is doing really good work to make the world a better place. They're doing really important work. That could be an individual, could be a business, could be an organisation doesn't need to be related to your field at all just anyone on this earth that you think is is worthy of a, a you know having a, a light shone on them we do one each absolutely more than merrier that's what it's all about uh, i'll start with a, a lady called fran uh, who runs an organization called kit squad which is part of the reaction collective and <clears throat> so fran well, won't have a problem with saying this but she's uh, low income and she's spends a lot of time in the outdoors does a lot of wild swimming and has experienced how difficult in some ways it can be to get the equipment that you need to access the outdoors. So there was a, a point where her, I think it was a son or a daughter, returned with a kit list for the Duke of Edinburgh Award and the kit list, I mean, it was five, 600 quid. And that's kind of a barrier because you look at this list and it's it's got actual brands on this list. And if you're, you know, if you're not into the outdoors, you kind of assume that you need to, you need mm. that stuff to take for your child to go and do Duke of Edinburgh. She knew that wasn't the case. She's got secondhand stuff. She knew she just needed to get the stuff together to be able to get her a child to go and do your credit. So she set up Kit Squad, which is basically an organization that is collecting and redistributing outdoor gear. People just have to prove to Fran that they are low income and then send her a list of things that they would like, basically a shopping list of, of materials and resources they'd like to get into the outdoors. It might be a tent, it might be walking boots, it could be a wetsuit. Um, and basically Fran will, will source that and get that into their hands. So it's wow. absolutely amazing because it's keeping, she, like she's got a really big sized warehouse wow. doing this. It's awesome. And it's keeping tons and tons of kit out of landfill, but also just giving people access to the outdoors who just maybe wouldn't have been able to access the outdoors. So mm. she definitely deserves to Very worthy. I agree. That's great. How about you, Heather? For me, oh, I don't know. I'm a little bit, I'm a bit swayed 
by, by a program that I watched a couple of nights ago with Hugh Fernley Whitting's okay. on it. Do I haven't, no. The, the big climate flight. And actually, I think that he's doing amazing work in terms of actually getting the message out there about onshore wind energy and renewable energy as an alternative as an alternative to fossil fuel fossil fuel generated energy and what he's doing is he's taking that fight to the government and i think that there's some organizations that are doing this and another organization that springs to mind is client earth and i think that we actually need to hold our governments accountable for their net zero policies and the problem at the moment is they're not being held accountable enough and things are fit well there are no new permissions for wind turbines for example going through at the moment and it's not because there is a ban but it's because the government are holding them up and they're allowing well they're not allowing them to happen basically and i think that we need organizations like client earth we need people who have the information who have the experience and who have the ear of people and the respect of people like you friendly witting souls that actually go and take that fight because it's not just you know as, m- as much as we would like it to happen in community alone we actually need some of the barriers to be unblocked mm. I mean, you know, we could talk about the government uh, kicking the can down the road of the um, of their net zero targets and that not being so much of a problem. And then them blaming so-called green zealots for not getting there, which makes no sense to me. The very people yeah. that might help them do that thing they've said they're going to do. But that's a story for another time. <laughs> Guys, yeah. thank you so much. I've I've really learned a lot there. Some of that was actually quite eye-opening for me. Some of those stats I really wasn't wasn't quite expecting. So thank you so much for sharing that with me. Thank you for giving me your time. You've taken an hour out of your your day your important work to to chat with me so i really really do appreciate it and i wish you all the best thanks very much it's been a pleasure thank you well we covered a lot more in that than i was suspecting and clearly these guys really know the stuff and more importantly they are passionate about what they do it certainly got me thinking about what's in my wardrobe and what did i buy for a single occasion or Maybe I bought it from a store simply because it was cheap, without a second thought on where it came from or what it was made of. These days, I do tend to buy from much more responsible retailers, such as Rapa Nui that we mentioned earlier. I really do recommend them, so I'm going to put a link for them in the show notes, as well as all of the organisations, the people and the brands that Gavin and Heather mentioned. There were quite a few. I know I gave them a chance for a shout out at the end, but by which point they'd already named a good five or six, so plenty of places for you to go looking for more organizations and people that are doing some really great work in the show notes that in itself actually gives me a lot of joy there's just so many great people out there doing good things and today i've spoken to two more of them there are actually a lot of crossovers in here to episode six with jim from the outward bound trust if you've listened to that episode where we took a deep dive into the importance of being in the great outdoors and i really love that Thank you so much for being here. Once again, reach out to me on the email cpi at soundquake.co.uk or the Spotify Q&A section if you're listening on there. And maybe after listening to this, have a little think about ways you might want to be a better citizen. What can you share? What can you repair? And if nothing else, get outside and get some fresh air.